Okay, so. <clears throat> the end of the session today, I will introduce another uh, extra practice which you uh, can take up optionally. So you're 20 minutes a day, that's mandatory. But what you do during that 20 minutes is optional. So I will give you another practice today. Uh, to take back and experiment or try out. But there is a problem with these kind of practices, special practices. And that is, there is a natural tendency for us to look for additional complexity, to feel like we're adding something on that we didn't have before. And really, meditation should be going the opposite direction. I noticed this a few years ago. I was with my good friend Marissa, many of you know her, and we were doing some sessions with a business group in Singapore, which was actually more fun than it sounds. And she was teaching some yoga and qigong to the group. And many of the people, especially the ladies, had done a fair bit of yoga before. And many of the men had never done any yoga before. So she was really teaching at a very basic, simple level. And the people that had done yoga before started getting a bit annoyed with her because they wanted more complicated things to do. In yoga, you do all these different asana, these different positions, right? So you start off with your dipping dog and things like this. But once you've dipped your dog a few times, you want to get into more advanced postures, right? The gyrating giraffe, and the wallowing warthog and the lying lion and the, all these different positions that... And Marissa kept saying, you know, it's not about twisting your body into a new movement. Unless you have a problem with a particular bone or set of muscles that you're particularly trying to work on, the idea is to bring mindfulness to the movement. It's not that you're attaining to something new, it's that you're returning your attention back home. Her, that didn't go down very well. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 but you know, I, I, I read about this particular posture and only 16 yogis can do it in India and I want to see if I can do it. And, and eventually she just thought up the most ridiculous difficult pose that she could possibly imagine, something where you have to twist your leg up and fold it around in a granny knot and lean it against a wall and, and said, right, you go and do that one. And then they were happy, you see. They couldn't do it, but actually Marissa can't do it either, she told me afterwards. <laughs> but they were happy because they're getting something new, something more complicated. And the meditation, including the yoga, in fact, and including the qigong, is not about getting to something more and more complicated. So, when we give you, like, meditation methods, these are little tricks only to help you settle into that simple, raw, naked awareness that is your own real nature. It's not that you have to go and practice more and more complicated meditation methods. The meditation methods may have value and they're great tools and pick them up and use them in a wise way at that time that is suitable for you. You have visualization techniques. I did a retreat once. You have to visualize 
a pipe going down from the top of your head that is red on the outside, white on the inside. And inside that pipe is a tiny mustard seed on which is written the sacred symbol in Tibetan, not Sanskrit. They were very clear about that. It doesn't work if you, if you think in Sanskrit symbols. And then you have to shoot this seed up from the center of your body to the top of the head where the pipe comes out the head. But on top of your head is a white Avelokiteshvara Buddha sitting there. And on top of him is a red Amidabha Buddha. And Amidabha Buddha has his big toe on the crown of your head which stops your mustard seed flying out. It's actually a really... It has a value, the practice. It has a certain method and a certain use and so it's actually a good practice you have to be in it to really understand it but by the end of the sessions I was just feeling oh I don't want to do it actually <laughs> I spend enough time imagining things you know my meditation time is the one time I don't want to be doing all this kind of stuff so things like visualizations and certain ways to breathe, they can be very useful, but ultimately the meditation should be getting more and more simple, not more and more complicated. These are tools that you use just to stop and be. The best meditation teaching I ever heard, sit and know you are sitting. That's it. I'm like, that's all I need. Shut up now. Leave me alone. <laughs> that's all you need. But it's quite tricky, right? Because your mind goes wandering off. You know, you have that idea, but your mind has other ideas and it will go and do something else instead. Another time I, I met this woman who had been doing a Mahasi Sayadaw practice. And in this practice, you, have, you watch the movements of the feet. And you go left moves thus, right goes thus, left goes thus, right goes thus. And then it's lifting, moving, placing, and then it's lifting the heel, lifting the foot, moving, touching, pressing, placing. So there are six stages to the movement of the foot. And this is how Mahasi Sayada would break down the walking meditation. And usually you start with the two movements and you work up to the six. And she told us, she's very proud of this, she said, I was with this teacher. And he taught us the seventh movement of the foot. <laughs> and we're like, okay, yes. And nor, you know, they don't normally teach this. They only teach this in very special circumstances. And like, you're starting to annoy me. <laughs> but I'll go along with it. I said, oh, I must have been very confident in the group that he had with, with him at the time. She said, yes, I was very lucky. This seventh movement it makes all the other movements of the feet make sense. I'm like, okay, you've jazzed me up now. What is it? I can't tell you. <laughs> it's a secret movement. You have to have reached permission. She said, it's not that I don't think your meditation is good enough, thank you. <laughs> she said, but I know I don't have permission to teach this thing and it's the, you know, very secret teaching. I'm like, oh, come on, give me a break. Like the foot moves, whether you break it up into four stages, six stages, 12 stages, 24 stages, it's, it's a movement of the foot. Unless you're moving your foot like this and then you have a little <laughs> flip to the side. <laughs> then I would accept, okay, there's a seventh movement of the foot that I'm not aware of. But she was very proud, you see, to have added this extra practice into her repertoire of practices. And it's not about that. Even the six movements of the foot, you know, if you can be with the movement of the feet simply nakedly with awareness that's what that's what you're aiming at that's why Mahasi Sayadaw was teaching these movements of the foot because if you say watch your feet move and feel the physical feelings your mind wanders off but if you say 
watch the lifting, moving, touching, pressing, placing, then your mind is caught up with the activity more and it will snap you out of the natural tendencies of the mind, the discursive mind that is always thinking. That's all it is, that's what the practice is for. So, the meditation is something that we should keep simple. And I've known a few people who, including myself, who have been so busy looking for a certain meditation practice that we've missed the fact that you're already meditating. Sometimes I'm sitting there quite peaceful and I'm quite peaceful and I think, oh, I should be noting my thoughts. Or I should be, you know, my breath, I forgot about my breath. It's okay. If you forget about your breath, that's okay. One of the questions that has come up is the thinking. And I'll talk more about thinking in one of the later weeks. But how to control the thinking and how to stop the thinking? Well, the thinking does have to stop. That's not something that every teacher or system would agree with, but I, I mean, I'm insistent and I can show you the suttas and scriptures. But if you try and force your thinking to stop, well, that's just another movement of the mind, right? That force is another movement of the mind, just like the thinking. So you're using a hammer to break a nut. But one of the tricks is to notice when you're not thinking. And if you pay attention to that, there's a lot of times during the day when the mind just quite naturally stops still and enters into a very beautiful, clear awareness. And at those times what happens is either you'll fall asleep or you'll think of something, right? You've got a bit of space, like, oh, right, I'll go and fish around in my bag full of nonsense that I carry around with me and find something that happened in the past, brush it off and have a think about that. Or I'll fish around in my bag and find out one of my plans for the future and, oh yes, I can start planning out my retirement home in New Zealand and the little farm that I'm going to grow and the avocados and I think I'll have some oranges and some lemons and then uh, I'd like to have some animals, I'd like to have some capybara living on my farm. I wonder if I can get a license to re raise capybara. And you're gone, right? I love capybara. Do you know these things? <laughs> these are they're like huge rats. Um, very placid creatures. This big? Yes. Yeah, okay. You have big ones, okay. I'm from England, we only have little ones. <laughs> and they're very placid, right? Yeah. Very peaceful creatures. They're very nice. Um, and that's what you do. You waste that moment where actually you'd stopped and you were bright and you were clear and you were aware. So meditation isn't really something that you force to happen, that you make to do. It's something that you find in amongst your mind as it already is. Your meditation is already there. You really just don't pay attention to it. So if you can stop and cherish those moments when the mind is bright and clear and aware and peaceful, and just relish that, the more you relish it, the more you cherish it, the more it's going to come back the more you ignore it and fill it up with some nonsense story from your bag of stories, then the less you are going to be able to notice it. And I think this is why often in India or in Thailand you find these people who are just beautifully gifted at doing meditation. And I think part of the reason for that might be because in the culture they have had this teaching of meditation already. So there's a kind of awareness that it's there. Certainly most of the Indians that I've spoken to, they, they all have an awareness that there is this deeper nature. So they're more in tune with it and more able to come and do the meditation. Developing this meditative or this awareness part of the character then is our aspiration. If you want to be a meditator, 
and not everybody wants to be a meditator. Uh, if you want to be a meditator, meditator, this is what we are cultivating. Don't wait too long to cultivate it, because if you wait until you're really sick, or you're really in crisis, or you're really dying, then it's going to be too late. Ajahn Chah said, teaching meditation to someone who is sick is like asking them to watch their breathing while you're poking them with a red-hot poker. It's very difficult. But if you've trained this meditation consistently for a long period of time, it's right there. In fact, it's so close to you that it becomes almost automatic. It becomes very easy. It becomes almost easier to do the meditation. And then you think, oh, now I have to get up for work. I just want to sit and meditate. This course, seven weeks, I actually took from a friend of mine who is a cancer surgeon in Hawaii. And he teaches this course online for people who have had cancer surgery. And he teaches this worldwide, but the people have to do it online. So every week online, they get a new set of tasks. They get a worksheet and they have to do it. And then they send in their reports. He has now got some uh, research funding after more than 10 years of doing this some funding to launch like a worldwide proper clinical research into this. But of course he has two difficulties. One is that the people are not there. They're in different places around the world. And you all know how often you've signed up for the courses online. Did you do them? <laughs> so that's one difficulty. And the other difficulty, of course, is that they're recovering from their cancer surgery. He always presents this as, um, is the word palliative, something you do after surgery. So it's not a replacement, it's not a preventative, it's something to help deal with the recovery. So it's very difficult if you waited until that time in order to start your meditation practice. I did have one friend, I mentioned him last week, he was the guy who was learning Thai and he had to travel on the sky train five days a week and he said his iPod was his lifesaver because he couldn't bear just to standing there on the train and not having something to do, something to occupy his mind. To me, I have the opposite problem. I have too much occupying my mind that I want to put it down. Uh, eventually, at 32 years old, went into hospital, he had an A-series flu and the flu shut down every organ in his body. He became within a hair breadth of death. He lost all the ends of his fingers and toes because his heart had not able to pump blood out to his extremities. And so he was 40 days in the ICU. He just got out of the ICU and then he died. So, sad story. But I'd known him for about four or five years. He was actually my closest friend in Bangkok at the time. And we were friends through computers. We were both kind of computer geeks. You know, we had similar kind of things and we'd share programs and experience. And I would come around and scrounge food. And so we had that kind of relationship. He was never really interested in meditation. But when he went into hospital, as he was coming out of this really terrible uh, state that he was barely conscious state, he woke up with this desperate urge to do meditation. I'm like, why do you want to do that now? You know, all these years that I've known you. And, but now I have to come to your hospital to do it. His parents were very much opposed to me. They were very strong Catholics and they didn't like him or his children being around Buddhism. So I used to go in the middle of the night so as not to disturb them. Also, he had no other visitors in the middle of the night because no one else was allowed into the hospital. That's one of the privileges of being a monk. We don't get many privileges, but access to hospital in the middle of the night is one of them. <laughs> 
And so he had this desperate urge to do meditation. Of course, he's in, not really in the situation to learn. But anyway, I went in there four or five days a week and we did meditation together during the night. So don't wait until it's that long. The only way to have this meditation strong is to develop it. And you develop it through consistent application. So all the tips and all the tricks, they're just tips and tricks. Really the thing is you have to do it. If Ajahn Brahm was sitting here now, the room would be full, full of 300 people. Is your meditation better with Ajahn Brahm? Really, you might like a particular teacher or you might like to, well, you might like his jokes, I guess. But really, if you want to develop meditation, you have to develop the meditation. The ego has a trick, you know, the ego wants to do something. It says, okay, I'm going to be you know, a beautiful, peaceful person. I made the resolution this year that I was not going to get frustrated with anything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it didn't work, but um, if you m use your ego, your willpower, I'm going to change from this into that, how long is it going to last? Really, you can't maintain willpower for a long period of time. The way that you do develop is by what you do, by living and working in the world. I have a number of videos of uh, American soldiers being trained and this is what we something that we study in psychology and the first thing that the these young guys do when they join the army and they join because they want to throw they want to carry machine guns and they want to fire tanks and they want to fire missiles from airplanes and the first thing they do is they have to make their bed right so the army knows that if you're going to train somebody, if you're going to change somebody, it's not with these ideas that I'm going to be this, this or this person. It's through a simple, daily, regular training practice. So the same way we are doing that with the meditation. This is what rituals are about. This is why rituals are a way to train yourself in a way that your ego or your willpower can't maintain. If you get up in the morning and you, you do your bows to the Buddha statue, it's remembering that to, in this day there is something that is greater than myself. There is something more beautiful than myself. There is something that I am aspiring to. And so you do your bows. I do my bows every morning, 12 bows. Uh, or do your chanting, do the recitation. We did some of it today. Uh, if you can do the chanting every day, Rituals are a way to develop a part of your character that your willpower can't develop. And this is why all religious traditions get into rituals. You do it in lay life too, right? When you get married, do you just kind of go and sign your name, right? Okay, dear, we're married now. You know, you want to introduce a kind of ritual. You want to make it harder to get married. You want to identify that space and aspiration by doing something a bit more difficult, a bit more ritualized. You get married in a nice dress or a nice suit. You don't get married in shorts and t-shirt. Most people. So the rituals that we do are what we call upaya, expedient means, tricks, if you like, that we use in order to develop a consistent practice. This meditation is coming home to yourself. It's not a dogma. We're not teaching you sacred chants and recitations. You're not being asked to memorize ancient teachings or worship certain gods or all the things that, you know, a lot of people do. The practice itself is actually just coming home to your own being. And that's real. That's what really attracted me to Buddhism in the first place. Because when I close my eyes and I turn my attention back, this is my own being. 
If it's bright, well, then it's really bright. If I'm sleepy, then it's, that's really sleepy. That's actually the experience that's happening. And that really attracted me about Buddhism, is that you're not trying to impose any external form. It's coming back to exactly who I am, exactly how I am. It's not a worship, it's not a ritual, it's not a competition. This is the way my being actually is. And what we're doing is we're turning the attention back on, this, on yourself. For all animals, our attention flows outwards. And when I say outwards, this is a model. There are different ways to model the experience of being alive, the experience of being a human being. And one should be careful about mixing models. You know, you, you use a model because it explains something and predicts something. Um, so we don't need to get too confused with mixing with different models. Freud did this. He had this conscious, conscious mind, pre-conscious and unconscious was one of his models. And then he had the id, the ego and the superego. And then he tried to say, well, the ego, is that in the conscious, the unconscious, or the pre-conscious? And where's the superego, is that? And he got horribly mixed up. I quite like Freud, but he really, he went completely off the rails when he was trying to mix his own models together. So when I say turning the attention back inwards, this is a model, right? This is just a particular way to understand your experience. So in this model, the attention of the mind flows outwards. Now, outwards is into the world. And the world means everything that changes. So your thinking also is considered out there in the world because it's something that moves, something that changes, it comes up, it goes down, it disappears, it comes back. It's happy, it's unhappy. So it's, it's considered outside, it's considered the world. So when we look at, say, the body and the mind, which we were doing earlier on in the meditation, in Buddhist terms, or in Indian mystic terms, both the body and the mind are both external. They're both in this realm of samsara, which is the things that change, things that arise and cease and pass away, things that are unstable. So both the body and the mind are both on that samsara, that changing side. On the other side, you have the unchanging. In Buddhism, we call this the unconditioned. In many of the, some of the Hindu schools, they call this the Atman. But the Atman, which they call a self with a capital S. But when you use self, that's not referring to yourself as your personality. The personality, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your neuroses, your fears, your past, your future, that's your personality, it's not your Atman. The Atman is unchanging, or in Buddhist terms, the unconditioned is unchanging. And this unchanging aspect to your being is your real nature, according to the mystic traditions. So in order to come back to your real nature, you have to turn the attention around and come back to your own self, your own home. And this is what we're doing in the meditation. Every time the mind wanders out into the past or the future, wanders out into the physical sensations of the body or the sounds or the sights, every time you find your attention getting caught up in those, you stop and you break that habit and return your attention back home. Sounds will go on and physical feelings will go on and there are times when you need to investigate sounds or feelings and we will work with that in one of the later weeks. But for this week I just want to have clear this idea of the mind leaking outwards into activity. And this is your habit. Habit is a good word for karma because you've done it in the past. Since you were very young, your parents were teaching you to look at the things that you can do 
the things that you can make, the things that you can attain. You've been trained from day one to send your attention outside. My parents were very proud of me when we had a big aga cooker, which is a coal, coke powered, coal power cooker. And to make the toast, you have to lift up the top and then you put your toast onto the cooker. And I wasn't big enough or strong enough to lift the top up. I could only get it halfway up. It was quite heavy. So I would always have to call my mother to come and start my toast. And then one day there's, there's like a tap at the bottom of the aga, I think it's a drainage tap or something. And I figured out if I stand on the tap, I can lift the top up of the aga all by myself and I don't have to call my mom. And I said, mom, mom, I can do it by myself. She says, oh, that's really good. Now I don't have to go and do it for you. So she gives me a whole bunch of congratulations. You're growing up, you're getting bigger, you're getting stronger, you're getting smarter. I'm so proud of you, I'm so happy. And then the tap broke because <laughs> I was standing on it. You're so stupid, you're so wrong. <laughs> so you've been trained from an early age to send your attention outwards. Here we're turning the attention back around and facing it back towards your own real nature. It's not something that's being made up. It's not something that you have to learn about or that's given by a Buddha or anybody else. It's your nature. And if it's your nature, well, then it should be something beautiful. This unchanging aspect. You can think of it like a light, like a torch in a room. And you shine the torch around a darkened room. And what do you see? You see the books, a bookcase, a TV, a computer, a desk, a chair, a table, a bed, a light switch, a picture, a ceiling, a floor, a carpet, right? You see everything except the light. The light's right there, right in front of your face. But you miss it because you're seeing the things. In the same way, your own real nature is right there. It's bright, it's strong, it's pure, it's never changed. It's not something that you create. It's right there, it's your nature. But you miss it because your attention is so caught up with the things that change. The things that come into your awareness. So our process is one of breaking the attachment to the things of awareness so that we can turn around and see the awareness itself. Seeing that will come, it may well have come, you get glimpses, you get flashes from time to time. The mind comes together you're like, oh right, that's it. The enlightened people, you know, they describe it as remembering. They don't describe it as, uh, you know, creating something, not even attaining to something. It's remembering something that was right there, it's right in front of you, so close that you miss it. There's a story that describes this. This is a story, favorite story of Punjaji Papaji, who's an Indian guru who I quite liked. He said there was a lion cub that got separated from its parents. This is before the Lion King, right? Just <laughs> it got separated from its parents and it got adopted by a bunch of donkeys. Now remember, stories work by representation, by symbols, and a donkey symbolizes <laughs> ignorance and innocence. Ignorance and innocence are very, very close together. This is an interesting topic, but we'll skip it. So the lion grows up with the donkeys, and it eats grass like a donkey, and it neighs like a donkey, and it gallops like a donkey, and it, I guess some things it doesn't do like a donkey. And then one day it's with the other donkeys, and the most frightening thing that is possible occurs. There's a great roar goes up in the jungle. And this is the lion's roar. And the lion is the king of the jungle because it has the king of roars. You know, you think an elephant would be king of the jungle, but it can't. You know, a trumpet is like a bit squeaky and forced, right? It's not a roar. And so all the donkeys are terrified and they all run off. 
And the lion is like, what are we running from? We're running from the lions, you know, they're dangerous. It so happened that one day the lions uh, snuck up on the donkeys and roared when they were very close. And the donkeys ran off, but the young lion cub, who has now grown up, who thinks he's a donkey, is captured by the other lions. And, but the lions don't eat him. And he says, the donkeys told me I had to fear you. And the lions said, there's nothing to fear. And they said, but why? You know, the donkeys tell me we have to fear you. And they said, yes, but you're not a donkey. You're a lion. He said, I'm not a lion, I eat grass, I neigh, I gallop. And they said, no, no, you're a donkey. He said, no, no, you're a lion. He said, I'm not a lion, I know I'm not a lion, I've never been a lion. Well, how can I become a lion? I'd like to be a lion. You know, what do I have to do to become a lion? And the lion says, you already are a lion. And so the, don the lion that thinks he's a donkey, what does he do? So the head lion says to him, all you have to do is roar. And eventually the young the lion goes off and he neighs and he makes some sounds and eventually he roars and he realizes, oh, that's right, I'm a lion. So Papaji would tell this story. He was an enlightened guy, I believe. How can you tell that? Take an online test or something. How can you tell? Well, uh, he would tell this story to say, you know, this enlightenment is your real nature. It's not something that you have to develop. It's not something that you have to attain to. It's what you are. It's who you are. You need to wake up and roar. So I really like this um, way of... I like things in story rather than metaphysics. It makes more sense as a story. So, this is your own, own real nature that you are returning to. In order to return to it, in order to stop seeing the object in the room and start noticing the light that is coming from you, from your hand, from your flashlight, you have to turn the attention around. To turn the attention around, we have to break the process of attachment with all the things of the world. So, this is what we're starting to do in meditation. When you sit, and you be with yourself, break that attachment. It's not going to be very worthwhile in worldly eyes to say, well, you're just sitting there, but this is the process to get back to who you are. According to the Buddha, he had one little story. He said, if coming back to this, what he called the unconditioned nature, would cost you 100 years of the most diabolical torment in the worst hell, I would say to you, do it. He said, but it isn't. This practice is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. It's one of the key sayings of Buddhism. So, this uh, unconditioned uh, nature is your own real nature. We're trying to break the attachment with the things of the world. Turn the attention around and be with yourself. Every so often the mind will just come together and become bright. And you, it seems kind of obvious, like, oh, that's it. That's where it is. Of course, then your ego, thinking, grasping mind, like, oh, yeah, I've got it now, I'm doing it. And, you know, wants to, you know, oh, hey, I'll be a teacher, you know, I'll give up my job and you know, I can teach meditation now. And, of course, it's all gone by that time. <laughs> tries to get hold of the experience, but just for that flash, just for that moment, you're like, oh, that's right. Some people will have had this. You can have it through drugs sometimes. You get like a glimpse. You have it in meditation sometimes. You have it in uh, near-death experiences sometimes. Uh, some people just have these experiences when they're very young. I remember a whole chain of experiences that I had when I was younger, that I think are what put that seed in my mind. Uh, these experiences come in two kinds. There are disenchantment experiences and illuminatory experiences. Of course, we all want the illuminatory experiences where suddenly you see brightness, you see light, you see beauty, you see, you know, this is what it really is. Oh, right, it's illuminating. You know, that's what we all like. 
But probably more useful are the disenchantment experiences. Oh, this is not what it is. This is not what it's like. This is not my real nature. And these are the experiences that start to break you from the attachment in the world. So I'll talk more about those uh, maybe in one of the other weeks. Uh, the task for this week to uh, go and practice, if you are of a mind to, is to count the breathing, count the breaths. So as you breathe in, you count one, and you breathe out. The next breath in, you count two, and you breathe out, and so on, up to ten. If you can get all the way from one to ten, and without your mind wandering off anywhere, then you go from ten back down to one again. Our, when you first do it, it's not that difficult. You can usually get from one to five, one to eight, one to ten. But the more you do it, the less far you're going to get. So eventually you can't even get to one without your mind wandering off somewhere. And you think, you know, boy, it's just getting worse. I really can't do it. This is good. Because you're starting to see your own mind more clearly. The only reason you could get from 1 to 10 is because you think you got from 1 to 10, but actually your mind was off doing other things. And then every so often it's like, 10, I got to 10. You know, it's like 1, what's for dinner? <coughs> two, three, four, five, and the other mind is going, what's for dinner? I'm going to have this, I'm going to go there, I'm going to see this friend. Ten, and then you're like, oh, I got to ten. <laughs> yeah, I must be a real meditator. The more you do it, the more you see you can't even get to one without your mind wandering off. This is good, because you can see what's happening in your mind, which ordinary people can't. If you haven't trained yourself, you can't see it. So don't be dismayed if you find yourself getting less and less close to 10. You may find yourself at other times when you do get to 10 and all the way from 10 back down to 1 again without the mind wandering off. Yeah, happens. This is not because you are now doing your meditation really well. This is because you were doing your meditation well in the past and now it's giving you the payoff, the dividend, if you like. So your good meditation, when you're really clear, this happens because of the work that you've put in previously, not because you're now doing it correctly. You win Wimbledon. It's not because you played the best match. It's because you've trained for the last 15 years on how to play tennis. Same with the meditation. So if it does come together, great. This is a result of what you've done before. It won't last for that long. If you can get from 1 to 10 and all the way from 10 back down to 1 again without your mind wandering off, you probably don't need to do the counting anymore. You can stop. And I want to leave it open to you. Dynamic meditation. You are the only one who is experiencing your meditation. I don't experience it. No teacher is going to come and experience it. Nobody is going to put their hand in your head and twiddle the knobs and set everything right for you. You're the one that experiences it. So it's up to you to determine whether you should be using this counting method or not. If the mind is coming together, it's bright and it's clear, you really don't need any special meditation method. You may note two kinds of uh, experience as the thinking goes ahead. One is that thinking will come up and you are lost, and you've lost count. In that case, you stop and you go back to one again. The other experience is you might find that the thinking starts to come up, but you don't get lost in it. So half of you is counting and the other half is kind of like trying to go off this way thinking. That's okay because you've maintained your awareness. You can keep counting and it counts. <laughs> but if you get lost in that thinking and you forget about the counting, you stop and you come back to one again. This will help to 
break the attachment to the thinking. And later on, we do investigation of states, which means we investigate things that are going on. And we investigate what thinking is, how it works, what its patterns are and are not. But to investigate it, investigation in Buddhist terms means observation or witnessing. That's how we investigate things. And so by doing this counting method, you're training yourself to be able to observe your own thinking. Because you're not losing your self-awareness and your self-presence while the thinking comes up and tries to grab your attention. You may even feel it pulling on you. Think of it like a thought tugging on your leash. Because your mind has you on a leash. It has you trained like a little puppy. And the thought comes up when it yanks you. Come, think about me, think about me. Believe me, believe me. And then you stop, hang on. I don't have to believe you and I don't have to follow you. This will afford you so many insights. But we'll talk about those another week. Um, so, try the counting method. I'm going to leave it up to you whether you do it, how you do it. You can get a little bit dynamic, which means you can play with it a bit, have fun with it, rather than <coughs> applying a rigorous meditation method that a teacher has given you. The seventh step of walking. <laughs> it's not going to get you enlightened any faster because you do the seventh step. So play with it a little bit. This dynamic approach to meditation means it will take you longer to learn to meditate than if I simply say to you, do this, this, this and this. Don't listen to any other teachers. Don't go to any other schools. Don't turn on YouTube. Do what I say. You can get into meditation faster that way. But it's not wise. And then you would always be reliant on the teacher. If you're willing to investigate and play a little bit, take a dynamic approach, it will take you longer to learn meditation. But in the end, you will be better at it. You'll be less dependent on a teacher. And you will know what the right meditation method is for the moment that you're in. Because some days you might really need to like screw your face up and really try. And other days you might need to just like, hey, I'm just walking down the street. I can't tell you. I don't know what your state of mind is. You probably wouldn't believe me anyway. So if you have practiced this kind of dynamic approach, you start to get the feel for what needs to be done. And in my opinion, I, I think, you know, one should trust you in these things. I never liked teachers that always told me what to do. I like to hear them tell other people what to do, and then I'll do it later. I'll do it later when I can pretend that I thought of it myself. That's always been my approach. <laughs> okay, so is that clear enough for everybody to do counting meditation? Any question? Yeah.